Hello students, have you ever heard of the word comedy? Yes, I know that most of you have heard it many times. It is a very often heard word. But in today's class, let us understand how it originated and developed as an important form of a drama or a play. Comedy is derived from classical Greek commodia and its usage is changed in the modern context. There are different kinds of comedy like comedy of manners, sentimental comedy, Shakespearean comedy, etc. Comedy is always used as a corrective source to correct the vices and follies of human beings. Comedy always demands for a happy ending and the reunion of the separated young lovers in the play. Thus, comedy occupies an important role in literature. The word comedy is a resultant word from classical Greek commodia. The modern usage of the word is generally restricted to the sense of laughter provoking. The modern usage originated through the Latin commodia and Italian commedia and passed through various shades of meaning. The Greeks and the Romans limited the word comedy to the descriptions of stage plays that had happy ending. In the Middle Ages, the word acquired a new dimension. The term expanded to include narrative poems with happy endings. Dante used the title of his poem La Commedia in this sense. During the Middle Ages, the term comedy became synonymous with satire and humour. Thus, comedy can be defined as a literary piece of work which is most often either humorous or satirical in tone and generally has a happy ending. As the Oxford Companion to the Theatre, edited by P. Hartnall, London, points out, the name means revel song. It is a combination of commos and ode. One form of revel was associated with fertility rites. It was a mixture of singing, dancing, scurrilous jesting against bystanders, and ribaldry. Aristotle derives comedy from this and certainly comedy contained all these elements including the use of the phallus, the symbol of fertility. Today much of it would be obnoxious to the laws of libel, blasphemy or indecency and of the rest a great deal would be rejected as too highbrow. In short, comedy can be thought of as a particular mode at least slightly genial of mocking propaganda for or against some desiderated norm. Now let us understand what are the important characteristics of a comedy. There are many characteristic features of a comedy that sets it apart from other genres of literature like farce, satire. Comedy is more social and less absurd. It discloses absurdity and it is never absurd. It is functional in society whether it intends it or not. Most often comedy places men in manners against certain standards and they differ according to the needs of the age. It is adaptable to the changes of the society. It is generally agreed that both comedy and tragedy originated from some primitive rituals and while tragedy was more closely related with the rituals of sacrifice, comedy was more related with the rites of ridicule, ribaldry and fruitfulness. Comedy has more scope for character and accident which is implied from its original relationship with life and productivity. Or fertility, which unlike death is not complete or absolute. The relationship of plot to the character in a comedy is one of unforeseen event and not a necessity. The protagonist is often monstrous, nevertheless not great. Comedy is corrective source to correct the vices and follies of an individual and the society 
at large. It can be corrective without being moral. Le Rire emphasizes on this aspect of comedy. Comedy need not always originate from disinterested impulse. It is clear that virtues and vices disagree with each other with the rules of legal necessities of society and hence it is open to correction by laughter. Thus, comedy is more likely to produce literature of value. After understanding the origin and development of an important form of drama or a play that is comedy and completing the characteristic features of a comedy, let us move on to the next one that is the different types of comedy. Let us now understand the first important type of comedy that is sentimental comedy. It originated in 18th century from a dramatic genre. The plays denote middle class protagonists who were triumphant by overcoming a series of moral trials and tribulations. Sentimental comedy aimed at producing tears and not laughter. It also emulated the existing philosophical beliefs of human beings as eminently good but at the same time vulnerable to go off track because of many bad examples. Through an appeal to his noble sentiments, any man could be reformed and can be put back on the right path that is the path of virtue. Despite of the fact that the plays consisted of characters whose nature was openly more virtuous than necessary and whose trials were also very easily resolved, they were nevertheless accepted by the audience as truthful embodiment of human circumstances. Collie's Sibber's Love's Last Shift, published in the year 1696, and George Farquhar's The Constant Couple, published in the year 1699, are a few examples of sentimental comedy. The best known sentimental comedy of Sir Richard Steele's The Conscious Lovers, published in the year 1722, deals with the vicissitudes of its heroine, Indiana. Sentimental comedies coexisted with traditional comedies like Oliver Goldsmith's She Stoops to Conquer and Sheridan's The Rivals, until the sentimental genre came to a close in 19th century. Let us understand what romantic comedy is. Romantic comedy is a form of drama which deals with love as its main theme and love leads to a happy ending always. The term romantic comedy is applied to the plays written by Shakespeare and some of his Elizabethan contemporaries. The plays revolve around love affairs which involved beautiful and admirable heroines. The course of the love was never smooth but eventually overcomes all the hurdles to end in a happy union of the lovers. Northrop Fire in his Anatomy of Criticism points out that some of Shakespeare romantic comedies involve a movement of the normal world of conflict and trouble into the green world, that is the idyllic pastoral world of the forest of Arden, as in As You Like It, on the fairy hunted wood of A Midsummer Night's Dream, in which the problems and troubles of the real world are magically dissolved, enemies reconciled and true lovers united. He believed that comic plots reinforce primitive myths and rituals that celebrate the victory of spring over winter, happiness over sadness. Another notable type of English comedy familiarized by Ben Johnson is the comedy of humours. The word humours attribute to bodily fluids to which medieval medicine ascribed various types of human temperament according to the preponderance of each within the body. As a result, the predominance of blood would make a person sanguine, while excessive phlegm 
would make an individual phlegmatic and excessive collar or the yellow bile would create melancholy. Johnson's comedy of humours portrays all the major character with a predominant humour that enables a characteristic strangeness or alteration in his disposition instead of a well-balanced individual. Johnson exemplifies his theory in the introduction to the play Every Man in His Humour and demonstrates the approach in his other comedies also. Johnson wrote in his introduction to Every Man Out of His Humour. As one someone particular quality doth so possess a man that it doth draw all his effects, his spirits and his power. In their conflictions all to run away, this may be truly said to be a humour. For instance, in every man in his humour, Kitely, the rich merchant has a pretty and a beautiful wife, of whom he is envious and jealous. Jealousy is his humour. Old Novel is worried about his son's safety and he is always anxious. Anxiety is his humour. Now let us understand what we mean by comedy of manners which is also called as restoration comedy. Comedy of manners is a term applied to English plays that belong to the restoration dramatists with a special mention of Congreve and John Wycherley. It is a form of comedy which can thrive well in any civilized and urban society. The same is seen in Sheridan's and Oscar Wilde's writings. Shakespeare's Love's Labour Lost and Much Ado Above to Nothing can be considered to be the earlier manifestations of this kind of comedy. This form of comedy deals with the relations and manoeuvrings of people belonging to a sophisticated society or an elite society. The comic effect depends greatly on the wit and vivacity of the dialogues. And to some extent, it also depends on the ridiculous non-observance of social conventions by insignificant characters like would-be wives, jealous husbands, etc. Comedy of manners is more or less satirical, yet in a very good manner and in a good way. However, this type of comedy was revived in the 18th century by Goldsmith and Sheridan through their works. She stoops to conquer and the school for scandals and the rivals respectively. During the 19th century, Oscar Wilde revived this form of comedy in the plays like The Importance of Being Earnest and Lady Wintermere's Fan. Now we are going to understand what we mean by tragic comedy. Tragic comedy is a combination of tragedy as well as comedy. The beginning of the 18th century witnessed a blend of both tragedy and comedy. The credit for the beginnings of tragic comedy in England can be attributed to John Fletcher's Faithful Shepherdess, a replica of the pastor Fido by the Italian poet Battista Gaurini, in his compendium of tragicomic poetry, published in the year 1601, Gaurini clearly explained the distinctive nature of the genre, allowing it to be a third poetic kind, different from both comedy and tragedy. Tragic comedy, he wrote, takes from tragedy, its great persons, its movement of the feelings, pleasure and not pain, danger and from comedy it takes laughter that is not excessive, an assuming amusement, artificial difficulty and a happy reversal. The form established very quickly on the English stage by the strength of Bowman and Fletcher's, Philaster and a king and no king and with a long series of Fletcher's unaided tragic comedies that prevailed during the 20 years before the closing of the theatres in 1642. Its influence and tragedy was always present on the English stage to mix scenes of amusement with serious matters. It also provided a tragedy with a double ending, a fortunate 
one for virtuous and an unfortunate one for the evil and the vicious as seen in Dryden's Aurangzeb or Congreve's Morning Bright. The next step came through Sir Richard Steele who reformed comedy for didactic purposes. His work The Conscious Lovers provided English stage with an opportunity when the audience at a comedy could obtain its pleasure not only from laughing but also by weeping. A Shakespearean comedy is a comedy that has a happy ending involving marriages between the unmarried characters. The tone and style is also very light when compared to his other plays. Shakespeare's comedies run through his language. His plays are abundant with clever wordplay, metaphors and insults. Shakespearean comedy contains more twists and turns than his other plays. A greater emphasis is given on situations rather than on characters. Young lovers often struggle to overcome the difficulties presented by their elders. Shakespearean comedies are resplendent with separation and unification. There is also an element of mistaken identity and women always disguise themselves as men. There are also multiple and intertwining plots. Eventually, happy ending dominates the play. Let us understand why we call Every Man in His Humor by Ben Johnson as a comedy of humors. Every Man in His Humor is Johnson's one among his best known plays. The play was staged in 1598 by the Lord Chamberlain's Men, which included Shakespeare in the cast. The play was first printed in 1601. Johnson revised the play for publication in his works in the year 1616. Regarded as comedy of intrigue, the play records the efforts of a young man born in a well-to-do family to marry his lover in spite of his father's attempt to stop the wedding. The play also promoted the theory of humours and it is considered as a major work of comic realism. Comedy of humours is synonymous with every man and his humour. Originally, it is a medical term. Humours were believed to be the fluids that regulate the body and human temperament. The theory can be traced back to ancient times where there are four distinctive body fluids that is blood, phlegm, black bile and yellow bile. Unequal ratio of these fluids in the body causes personality disturbance. Johnson worked on these theories in his drama to achieve great effect. The characters in the play display their imbalances of humours. Johnson was not the first to make use of the idea of humours in a play, yet he excellently used the conceit and such characterization continued in all his works. Hope everybody understood the origin, development of comedy and its characteristic features. We also understood the different types of comedy. Now let us conclude. The notion of comedy started with Aristotle in ancient Greece of 4th century prevails even in the present. It believes that comedy is chiefly concerned with human beings as social human beings rather than private persons. The main function of comedy is always corrective. The main role of a comic artist is to reveal the vices and follies of men and women in the society with a hope of mending their ways and behavior. I am sure everybody understood the origin, development, changes and growth of comedy both in drama as well as play. Let us meet in the next class with next topic. Thank you.